everyone. We are going to get started. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, we are doing this webinar because we know that the last year and a half has been extremely difficult for all of us, especially our small businesses. And for me, um, small businesses just really represent the fabric of who we are in San Francisco. I grew up in a family with a small business in the Central Valley. Um, we had clothing stores that my grandfather started in 1936 um, with one store, and then he was able to expand to many more throughout the Valley. And uh, I know how important it is to make sure that we support our small businesses in any way we can. And of course, with the pandemic, um, we've had our challenges. The one good thing we know about San Francisco is that we have been very resilient with regard to how we've responded to the pandemic. And the fact that we have 80% of our population 12 and up fully vaccinated is truly uh, a success that I think we can all be happy about and one that is leading to um, better outcomes for our small businesses. But what we learned during this pandemic is, um, and what we've known really all along, is there are many things that uh, are impediments to small businesses, not just uh, in how they open and how they operate, um, but it's shown us how uh, we need short-term and long-term changes with regard to getting permits to open and of course, how to continue to operate in this city um, for a variety of reasons. At the beginning of the pandemic, over 50% of our small businesses immediately closed, which was absolutely devastating. Um, we know that that number has been reduced given the city's ability uh, to provide testing and new vaccines to our residents. And right now um, we are seeing a closure rate of less than 50%. And the number of small businesses um, that are opening is also trending upwards, which is great. Um, over the last year, several new programs and pieces of legislation were passed to offer relief uh, to small businesses and to streamline the permitting process. And we really wanna go over those here and to have a place where people can come and to learn more about those. That includes the uh, new permit center, first year free program, shared spaces program, and of course, Proposition H. So to walk us through all of that, I am very honored to introduce the Director of the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, Kate Sopis. She will present on these changes to policies and programs um, that we're offering for small businesses over this last year. And Director Sopis is an internationally regarded leader in equitable urban economic development. Before OEWD, she was the co-founder and CEO of SFMADE a public-private initiative that has helped catalyze a resurgence in local manufacturing and diverse employment in San Francisco. She also recently served as a member of the San Francisco's COVID-19 Economic Recovery Task Force. So thank you, Director Sofis, for being here today, and I'll let you take it away. Great, good morning. Thank you, Supervisor, and thank you uh, for this opportunity to, to connect at least virtually with the community. Um, you know, having started this role here at the city four months ago during the pandemic, um, these sorts of opportunities that allow me to, to speak directly to parts of our community are really essential for me personally, but also it lets us uh, here at OEWD uh, have yet one more way that we can hear directly from our businesses and from our community so that we can continue to refine our programs. I think the, the the exciting part that you'll see as I lay out some of what we've already done and, and some of what we are continuing to work on in partnership with um, the supervisor uh, really speaks to uh, our engagement with the business community. So much of what we do is directly informed by the, the experience that you all are having right now. Uh, trying to run your businesses um, through this pandemic and beyond. So with that, um, uh, Montana, let's jump to the first slide. So as we stepped into the pandemic, we pivoted very quickly as, as an entire department. And just to sort of scope briefly, the Office of Economic and Workforce Development includes our workforce division, which works to get uh, unemployed and underemployed San Francisco residents into jobs and, and careers. Uh, we have our economic development division, which includes our Invest in Neighborhoods team, uh, which works out in neighborhoods across the city, focusing on our neighborhood commercial corridors and on communities of color. We have our business development team, actually, uh, who are here with us today. Um, Laura Bonatides and Ben Van Houten are here uh, if we have detailed questions for them. Uh, but that team works on our sector-based strategies and also has really led the charge on uh, again, in partnership with um, the supervisor on some of our reforms 
uh, that we'll talk about in a minute, Prop H, um, among others. Um, and then we have also um, Katie Sherping, who is focused on permitting. Um, and if we have detailed questions on permitting, uh, we will be able to hopefully field some of those today. Uh, so with that, the whole mission of OEWD is to help businesses start, grow, and stay, and thrive here in San Francisco. Overwhelmingly, the work that we do is focused on small business. So to give you a sense of some of what happened um, during the pandemic, uh, OEWD administered a little more than $24 million directly in small business relief, which was a combination of grant programs, loan programs, um, and if you go to the bottom of this slide, District 2 alone uh, had 89 uh, businesses take advantage of grant and loan awards for a total of almost $750,000. One of the other pieces that I think is very important to highlight is uh, how much of an equity focus we do have here at OEWD and at the city in our work. So I'm particularly proud of statistics such as um, more than half of this relief went to women-owned businesses, 52.1% as an example. Um, and we also, uh, of course, have a, a real focus as well on uh, racial um, and ethnic diversity as this slide shows. Next slide, please. And we're not done here. So. Um, this slide shows what is now in our approved budget. Um, thank you again uh, to the supervisor and the board of supervisors for supporting uh, this level of investment and our mayor, of course. So as we move forward, we will continue. Uh, we're not out of this yet. So we will continue to be focusing on investing in our small businesses, in our neighborhood businesses. Um, and one um, new area of investment I do want to highlight is we are um, on the, uh, the blue column, we are also continuing to invest as much as we can in getting our um, downtown and city core businesses, who many of whom have been shut for much longer than in some of the neighborhoods, up and running again. And you might say, well, why do we why do we care? Um, you know, if we're in in one of the districts that's not uh, sort of downtown. And really what we recognize is so many of you have businesses that benefit from visitors, benefit from tourism, or have business relationships with some of our downtown city core businesses. We also recognize that continuing to focus on our street safety, cleanliness, and creating a welcoming environment downtown and out into our neighborhoods is going to be really critical for employees to feel comfortable coming back to work and for visitors to feel comfortable coming back to San Francisco. So that is um, on our radar and very much part of our continued investment. On the visitor front, I don't have a slide on this, but I do wanna highlight that Time Out Magazine uh, just yesterday um, published that San Francisco was in their estimation, the top city in the world to uh, plan a visit to right now. It's worth uh, reading that article because A, it's nice to hear some really good news about San Francisco, but also I think it does speak to some of the assets we do have and we know we have, uh, particularly in our small business community. And the fact that we have been leading the charge nationally in uh, COVID response, in our health response, that we have fewer deaths, that we have higher vaccination rates. And I wanna personally thank all of you as businesses particularly our restaurants, our bars, who have been stepping up to help us um, enforce vaccination mandates. All of that is really coming together, not only to protect us as a city, but really is a key part in helping, um, helping us stay open, helping your businesses stay open, and over time, helping both employees and visitors uh, come back to the city. Next slide. So some of what we have done or in, and is in process right now, Shared spaces is, is maybe one of the, the most visible things that we have done uh, together with the planning department and all of our legislators as a city to help all of you respond to this pandemic. And it's probably the number one thing in that time, art, uh, time out article that was first highlighted about what makes it great to come back to visit San Francisco. It's that shared space program. So we are excited that that has been permanently legalized and excited to see what more of you will continue to do um, who have access to those spaces. 
We have also been working very hard to continue to modernize our zoning. Uh, Proposition H is a good example of that. Um, we have been working hard to create as much uh, diversity and um, ease uh, to have smaller events and activation. So some of the permits that allow us to have activities in rear yards, um, as an example, uh, or reforms to some of our live performance permits, which let businesses add music and entertainment to their offerings. These are all examples of ways, small ways, but we think meaningful ways that we've been trying to make it easier for businesses of all kinds to be creative and to find additional ways to, to draw folks to their businesses. Um, what more can we do? And I, I would be surprised if we do not talk a little bit more about this later on, but we currently have a pending Small Business Relief Act. Uh, again, I have colleagues on this webinar this morning that that can dive more deeply into that should we be interested in that. But that Small Business Relief Act will really uh, continue to build on some of these things that we've already done to make it easier, again, for businesses to start and to expand um, in their neighborhoods. Next slide. And we can and will, I think, make these slides available to, to folks after, um, after this webinar. So uh, if, you, if we see URLs and websites and things, um, I don't worry, you don't have to write them all down. We should be able to, uh, through the supervisor's office, make that available to all of you. So on reducing cost, uh, really there are two key things here. The first is for those of you who have restaurants and, and need to uh, partner with our delivery services across the city to be able to get food to your customers. And a very important piece of legislation was to cap delivery service fees at 15% um, and, and to enforce it. So uh, it's something that has been very meaningful and important and again, uh, material to all of our restaurants who are struggling with their operating margins during the pandemic and beyond. And then uh, first year free legislation uh, just passed. And this really, uh, you know, I think we are gonna become a national model around this. So this is uh, allowing us to waive fees, permitting fees for new businesses to start on a storefront um, for the next year. So we're really trying to both take care of our existing businesses and also make it easier for new businesses to fill those vacant retail spaces in your neighborhoods um, and get started. Next slide, please. Another key area we've been focusing on and we will continue to focus on uh, pandemic notwithstanding is continuing to improve the experience that that you as business owners have with our city. And some of what I've already talked about is, is part of that. Certainly the first year free streamlining permitting is part of that. Um, we also have um, included in this year's budget a new set of positions at the permit center. So we recognize that the permit center, um, which is not run by um, OEWD, but is the place that you go when you need permits to open a business, to expand your business, that there are times that a business, a small business needs more uh, sort of direct um, hand-holding, a concierge service is almost how we think about it. So um, we now will have two full-time staff from our Office of Small Business, which is a part of OEWD, at the Permit Center. And so that will allow us for businesses that need to avail themselves of those services, that will allow us to stay much closer to you through that process from start to finish, from start to opening. Um, and we know from feedback we've had from businesses that that is also very important that we focus on that. Another, uh, I guess you can call it innovation, um, sort of uh, you know, crisis uh, breeds innovation uh, that we have been piloting throughout the pandemic has been to partner uh, uh, to create an opportunity to register your business so that we can get communications out to you. Um, and that's the tax collector that is in partnership with us, but that allows us to be able to push information out, whether it's on health orders or it's on other um, you know, more exciting information than that over time. We think that that's going to be a very important mechanism, not only as we exit the pandemic, but to, on an ongoing basis, more quickly and easily be able to communicate with our small business uh, community. Um, we have also eliminated 311s for principally 
permitted changes of use and are guaranteeing permits for principally permitted storefront uses in 30 days. Next slide, please. So this is the slide that we promise we will make available so you do not have to scribble down all of the details, but we have a lot of other resources right now. And these are all things that we are maintaining actively, uh, but to sort of tick through them because some of these may be very important to some of you. So the first is the moratorium on commercial evictions. So you all may know that we have had an ongoing moratorium on commercial evictions that has been in place pretty much from the start of the pandemic. And it has had different expiration dates that are controlled at the state level. Um, but the current expiration date, uh, which we believe is probably going to stay put, is the end of this month, September 30th. And I know that probably causes um, anxiety for those of you who have missed a rent payment during that period and are not yet sure of how you will recover. So we recognize this is a really important moment in time to make sure that we are here to support you. So a, a few things to reassure you. The first is that um, the Board of Supervisors and the Mayor passed legislation not long ago that uh, protects many of you who have fewer than 100 employees and gives you more time to pay back your back rent. So just know that if you have a small business, most of you will have some protections that allows you to have anywhere from six months to up to two years um, to pay back that back rent and to negotiate with your landlord a plan to do that, that uh, keeps you in business. Um, on that point, we also have gone ahead and uh, have funded several nonprofit partners who can provide free legal and mediation support to you and your landlord to help you come to an agreement. So the website that is listed on this slide, oewd.org, Commercial Evictions Moratorium, has all about both the protections that your business may have beyond the expiration date of the 30th, as well as some of the different uh, resources you can avail yourselves of for free um, to be able to work with your landlord to, uh, to strike an agreement. Other resources that I want to make you aware of right now. So one is Jobs Now. So Jobs Now has been a longstanding program that I know many businesses have used over the years to enable them to bring on new hires, um, often entry level hires, uh, who can jump into your business and get training on the job and, and be productive. And for um, for many of these positions, we are able to fund uh, subsidies for you to hire them. Um, and we have uh, created now a deepening of this program. So we have some deeper subsidies for this. And you can find out more about jobs now on the sfhsa.org website. Employee retention tax credit. This is one I really want to highlight for all of you because I'm finding and we are finding that many of our businesses are not aware of this. So um, I am guessing some of you, many of you hopefully took advantage of the payroll protection program when that was made available to us uh, federally. Um, and they have also taken advantage of SBA emergency injury disaster loans. I will talk about that in a minute. But there is a third federal program that folks um, seem to not have necessarily taken advantage of at the same level, and this is this employee retention tax credit. It is a refundable tax credit worth up to $33,000 per retained employee in 2020 and 2021. I will warn you that it really is most um, efficacious if you work with a CPA because there are some more complications to how you file and document that um, are, make it a little bit more onerous to, to do all by yourself. But we have a set of resources and providers who are uh, ready to step up and work with you at oewd.org ERTC. You can learn more about the program there. Again, it's a federal program but it's significant. And for those of you who have employees, I think it's well worth a look to see if this might be a program that would make sense for you to apply for. The Emergency Injury Disaster Loan Program or EIDL program is an existing program. It was a pre-existing program um, offered by the SBA before the pandemic. 
and it is still there. And I think, again, if you haven't taken advantage of that, looked at that, you should. Um, it provides a very low interest loans um, of less than 4% for a for-profit business um, and a very uh, lengthy and reasonable repayment term. So that's worth looking at um, as another capital source. And last but not least, the Small Business Recovery Loan Fund is a California loan fund um, that is still available. Again, it's another form of very low interest, no interest um, debt that you can bring into your business and have a lengthy repayment process. Next slide. So I think at this point, um, I'd like to turn it back over to our supervisor and facilitator and uh, very open to questions and the conversation. Um, supervisor. Thank you, Director Sopis. That's such great information. And I know that we'll be able to get those slides out to everybody. And obviously this is being recorded. I know that we've had questions that were sent in and I wanna ask um, Emily how we are going to present those questions. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, Director Sophus, would you mind, I think some of the questions that came in from our community members, uh, some specific questions about, you know, their businesses, programs that are offered and, and how they can best utilize them. If you wouldn't mind taking away it away, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, so Emily, do you want me to read through the questions or did you Yeah, to... that would be great. Uh, I think we had a handful of questions that came in. Uh, if we want to address those, uh, or attendees were given the option to pre-submit okay. questions. And then for those who are listening now, if you have a question that wasn't answered or if you have something uh, new that comes up, please feel free to drop that in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen and we will try to address them as time allows. All right. Great. Well, I, I, will, I will start in no particular order. Um, so I'm gonna start with this one on permitting and I'm thinking uh, either Katie or Laurel, you, this might be a good one for you. Um, so as a lifelong resident of San Francisco and an owner of property in the marina, I am concerned about the lack of permitting in res uh, it, with respect to the parklets and the shared spaces. The bars and restaurants have created large parklets with no permitting and they've taken over the sidewalks on the Chestnut Corridor, so there's no room to walk down the street. Um, I feel like I have no recourse. What is our recourse if we're not one of those restaurants that has benefited from uh, shared spaces? Director yes. Arbenatidis. Hi, um, thank you, thank you, Kate. Um, uh, I think clearly, first of all, any shared space does require a permit. So all of these should be permitted. Um, the Board of Supervisors passed a permanent program for shared spaces that does think a lot about um, ensuring passability on sidewalks. Specifically, it requires an eight foot wide path of travel wherever it's physically feasible. And on narrower sidewalks, six feet is the minimum clear width that is required. Um, if that is not being maintained or if you're having a lot of trouble with your neighbors in that space, please call 311 and report it either on the mobile app, calling it or on the web. Um, this triggers follow up from the city agencies to address the issue. Um, and reporting on 311 helps us track hotspots. So if we see that a certain street is having lots of problems, we can go out and do more intensive, intensive outreach and, and rec corrections um, and direct resources to that area for a longer time. And I'll just add to that too, if there are problems with parklets in District 2, anywhere in District 2, you can call our office as well at 415-554-7752 or contact, contact us at stephaniestaff at sfgov.org. We've had a few complaints about some parklets and you know we've been working with the owners. And so we are always, of course, happy to intervene in addition to calling 311, but um, our office is here for you as well. Great, and I'm gonna have a follow on uh, Laurel since you're, you're on. Um, this is a broad question, but why do we put small businesses often through both a change of use and conditional use permitting process? It's hard enough with COVID. It's almost impossible to deal with that and the, the time and the money. 
um, at the same time? So it's a broad question, but maybe you can talk. I know it's something you're personally passionate also about um, making better. So we've, uh, yeah, thank you, Director Sobis. We've spent the last year, I think that was one of the big changes in Proposition H was to move a number of, a, a large number of uses into more permissible, into more permissible use categories to reduce the number of uses that needed to have um, conditional use and to make it more holistic across the city rather than restaurants in this space require and not in that just really, really being thoughtful about making it more permissible throughout the city. <clears throat> and by doing that, that's eliminated the change of use in, or, or, sorry, that's eliminated the conditional use authorization in many instances. It has also um, made it so that all those pr principally permitted uses now have access to the 30 day portal, which includes the change of use. So you can um, so usually get a change of use over the counter, but often you have more permits that you need. And so those can go into the 30 day portal now for these principally permitted uses. So we've one, reduced the number of types of businesses that require a conditional use and two, try to speed up the change of use. And this is automatic now. I mean, if, if if someone shows up at the permit center, this should just be in place. They shouldn't have to remember that this was just put in into law. Right? Correct, correct. It, there's a portal for Proposition H that is actually quite, and now SBRA, that is quite helpful and digital. And it, it, it provides you as the business owner with a very clear set of documents that you'll have to fill out rather than trying to navigate everything. But the permit center will also allow we will have those people in place to help you navigate that if you prefer to do it in person. And um, actually the, the um, person who asked the question wants to have us repeat the um, phone numbers for additional concerns. Uh, I think this might've been the previous question. Um, so can we repeat the phone numbers that folks need to call or put it in chat if they see um, an infringement of the restaurant uh, shared space situation on sidewalks? Great, we have something from Emily, thank you. Um, it, Laurel, is there more coming in the small business? Let's talk briefly about the Small Business Relief Act. So this is um, a new piece of legislation that is not, not passed yet. It's making its way through the process. And, and what's in it that we could look forward to if it passes? Yeah, so it did. It it, did, it has a lot of reforms, and a, a small section of it was able to move through the process before recess. So that allows um, anything that was principally permitted and did not previously require a three eleven notification to move through to gain access to the thirty day portal. Proposition H had only allowed this in the neighborhood commercial corridors, and so this expands that to spaces like Union Square and downtown and the Tenderloin. We've seen those spaces take. Uh, continue to see impacts from the reduced number of office workers and tourists in town. And so we need to make sure that they have the same access to, to fill those vacancies and get going as interest resumes in those neighborhoods. Um, it, the, the, the part of the legislation that is still pending is aimed to, in the eastern neighborhoods, so parts of Soma and the Dog Patch, um, where there is still a 311 neighborhood notification for principally permitted uses to remove that notification. And by doing that, it will allow people access to the 30 days. Otherwise, when someone is making a principally permitted change, they still have to wait 90 days for us to send a letter to all the neighbors to tell them that is happening. Um, and this is a letter that rarely results in any sort of comment and instead just is a burden on the business often. Um, additionally, the other large piece in this in the still being um, evaluated legislation is the is moving more uses into the expedited CU process. So this is where if many uses are conditional use and may and it is a right choice for there to be discussion about those uses, but that process can take in an unknown amount of time. So if you're signing a lease as a, as a business owner and you are a bar, you don't know how long it will be before you can get to commission. This legislation suggests that we should guarantee that those uses can get to commission in 90 days. Neighbors will still be able to provide impact, in, input in the use at commission, but that business owner, that property owner, and the community will know that this will be heard within 90 days and a decision made. Great. Thanks, Laurel. Uh, ben, since I see your smiling face, could I ask you a question uh, about sort of 
our now flexibility around interesting entertainment uses in backyards and, and otherwise, just uh, to give us a little more color about what kind of new flexibility that a business might have to program a sort of a pop-up event or, or music in association with their business? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think many of us who uh, work with artists and musicians know how, how really devastated they have been by the pandemic. Um, so creating new opportunities for businesses to be able to activate and enliven uh, their spaces or for property owners to explore pop-up activities while also supporting our arts and culture. There's a lot of really, you know, potential win-wins out there for a lot of people. Um, in terms of Prop H and recent legislative efforts, there's a lot now that businesses can do around entertainment with a lot less of the um, uh, time and, and, and permit expense. So um, one of those is that uh, moving forward, if a business wants to have a single unamplified performer, so bring a violinist or a guitar player into your business, you no longer need to go through an entertainment permit process as long as it's, again, one unamplified performer uh, ending by 10 p.m. So, you know, I, I think that's a real opportunity for not just places that are, you know, consider themselves music venues, but a lot of different businesses. We want people to welcome arts and music into uh, those businesses. Um, there's also additional flexibility now around uh, uh, one-time events to really help uh, support making those sorts of events and outdoor events uh, more recurring. You know, we've seen a lot of activity during the pandemic around uh, farmers markets and other outdoor spaces adding entertainment. Um, before the pandemic, you could only have entertainment at a given space uh, 12 times a year, an outdoor space with a uh, 12 times with a one-time event permit. And now uh, the Entertainment Commission has the ability to go beyond that where it makes sense with all the appropriate conditions to really uh, support outdoor space as well. Um, additionally, there is additional uh, flexibility for folks who have limited live performance permits. So if you uh, want to add music or entertainment to your retail business, you can do that with a limited live performance permit. It's a, it's a very straightforward permitting process for a, for a brick and mortar business. Uh, those spaces can now offer music and entertainment until 11 p.m. Uh, out, out the gate, where previously you would start at 10 p.m. and then have to wait a year and then go back to the commission uh, to, to go until 11 p.m. So there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, turning briefly to pop-ups, there, there's all sorts of opportunities around temporary activity in vacant storefronts or in storefronts that want to, you know, I'm a, I'm a bookstore right now, but I want to add, uh, I want to think about adding some food, adding some music on a temporary basis. I'm not sure that's going to work. There's really a wide variety of creative options now um, that happy to work with any business owner that is thinking about, you know, trying something out to experiment, to round out their, their offerings. Um, so yeah, we'd be happy to, and I know that, you know, the colleagues on here as well, we're all, we're all very interested in supporting creativity and, and creative activity. And there's a lot of new tools to help that. So Ben, is this the kind of thing where there's a website or is there contact information people should talk to you about some of these ideas as sort of our resident in-house entertainment uh, vertical sector person? Sure, um, around entertainment specifically, I'm happy to be a contact as well as the Entertainment Commission has some great website stuff that we'll put in, we'll, we'll put in the chat. Great, if you can um, put those into the chat for folks, yeah, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Um, Katie, since you are on, I think I have a question for you. Good morning. Um, so we're gonna talk fire department. <laughs> Why is the fire department required to do an additional inspection even after they have approved and issued an occupancy permit on a health department permit? It seems completely redundant. That's a great question. Yeah, this is um, often something that, you know, you've gone through your whole permitting process and your build out and you think you've completed your fire inspections um, and all of a sudden there's one more fire inspection you need. So I know that can be um, really frustrating for businesses as they're sort of looking towards uh, an opening date and figuring out what they need to do beforehand. Um, in a very technical sense, there is some different content that gets inspected for your sort of completing your build out and your job card, that first fire inspection, as opposed to the operational inspection um, that fire has to do as a result of that health permit. Um, but I think it's a really great point. It's a great um, opportunity for some additional streamlining of 
you know, when, when there is a case where both of those permits are going through at the same time, um, how can we systematize making sure that that can roll into one inspection rather than having to schedule the two different ones? It, it's, a, it's a great question. Katie, do you see our two new permit center positions as, as maybe being able to kind of dive in and help work on improving that to your suggestion? I think totally. I mean, there, there are two pieces that we gain from those new permit center positions. So one is that um, even before any process improvements happen, um, if you as a business go down to the permit center to apply for these permits, um, you'll have someone who's really versed in bit small business permitting, who's able to sort of coach you and prepare you for that ahead of time. So those inspections are one of those things where even when they're frustrating, if you're well prepared and you know you're going to you know, have this one and then this one and you can sort of plan them appropriately, um, you may be able to sort of deal with it um, when prepared and knowing it's coming. It's when that's a surprise at the end of your process that it can really throw you off. So that's the first really important piece is that getting all of that information and really having a sense of the sort of totality of your permit process up front um, is going to be really helpful. And then at the same time, I think yeah, having, having those people who are on the ground seeing the same problems that come up over and over again, that's a great additional resource for OEWD, for the supervisor's office, for sort of all of us involved as we're thinking about what comes next um, in terms of process improvements. Great, thank you. Um, I think I have been told to turn the mic back over to our supervisor. So uh, with that, back to you. Thank you, Director Sophus, and thank you to your incredible staff, Laurel, Ben, Katie, and Martha's also on here. Um, we are so, so lucky that I think she's on here. Um, in, we, in spirit, if not in person. Okay. <laughs> uh, but really, we, I love OEWD. We are so lucky to have such talented people. And of course, Director Sophus, we're lucky to have you leading the department. And I did want to mention, too, um, before we close, uh, because I am not in denial as to how hard it is for our businesses to operate uh, in the climate we're in uh, once they are up and running. And I feel like I would be remiss in not mentioning uh, the difficulty um, that some people are having. We just had four break-ins on Fillmore Street, uh, maybe even more. Uh, I know that somebody had contacted me after I posted something about the um, Storefront Vandalism Relief Act, which is also under OEWD. And that was passed, I think was spearheaded by my colleague, Supervisor Mandelman, to provide up to $2,000 in financial relief to those, um, to businesses who qualify, um, whose windows are broken or who need um, to invest after um, being vandalized. And I, I just want to be clear that I'm, I don't, I don't think we should be in a situation where we even have to have the Vandalism and Relief Act. I think that we should do everything we can to make sure people aren't vandalized in the first place. And I just want to make that very clear. And it's why uh, I continue to focus on making sure we have academy classes and we have overtime for our police department for foot patrols and that we're working with our captains uh, in District 2 to provide those foot patrols. But we have to do more there. And I just want everyone to know who's watching this that I am aware of that. And it's something that I am focused on. Uh, we should not, you should not have to go through this over and over again. And it's something that I will continue to work on. And if you have any questions about that, um, the relief grant, as it applies to vandalism, again, you can contact OEWD or our office as well. So in terms of What's next? As we mentioned, there's the Small Business Recovery Act that the mayor introduced. I am a sponsor of that. I'm very supportive. Uh, she introduced that in March of 2021, and it's currently pending in the Land Use Committee, the Land Use and Transportation Committee. So you will have a chance to offer public comment when that is scheduled. Again, we can let you know uh, when that hearing is coming up. But really, you know, that's just to build on Prop H to streamline the process to make it even easier. We know it's very popular to do this. Prop H passed at the, um, by the voters in November 2020 with over 60% of the vote. And really, you know, the three main priorities of the Small Business Recovery Act is to reduce the bureaucracy, to continue to do that, and to increase flexibility for our small businesses. And of course, is, you know, to piggyback on what Ben said, to support our arts and culture in San Francisco. So we will keep you posted on that in terms of when it comes to committee. I, I think it's a great um, piece of legislation. And like I said, I'm very supportive. 
and will continue to do everything I can to support our small businesses. I was happy to um, pass the um, Small Business Relief Act where we were able to waive over $20 million in fees for uh, and refund businesses uh, who were forced to close during the pandemic. So um, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you again to the Chamber of Commerce actually for providing this forum um, so we can host um, this webinar, and again, to Director Sofis, your staff, and to my incredible uh, staff, my legislative aide, Emily Abraham, who's helped to make this possible. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.